Okay, uh, I think it's time, 2.40. Hey guys, um, this is Venkatesh. I, uh, you know, have been part of the Hadoop team uh, at Yahoo since 2007, then, you know, working on, I used to work on data management solutions at Yahoo. I built a couple of generations uh, of data management solutions. And, you know, at Hardenworks, I used to work on data integration initially and started uh, the Falcon project. Um, I, I'm also part of uh, Apache Knox. I don't know how many of you know about it, which provides perimeter security. And I just proposed Apache Atlas, a data governance solution, which is a much lower layer service for um, all things Hadoop and outside Hadoop. Um, we're gonna look at you know motivation behind Falcon. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you use it or um, you know are familiar with it. So we'll cover some you know very basics. Uh, saying why Falcon, you know, and kind of drill down into the architecture and uh, look at the governance capabilities that we started building even before uh, we kind of thought about Apache Atlas and, and look at, you know, what's the latest and what's coming um, ahead. Um, you know, a simple data, you know, people start Hadoop, you know, it's very, very simple. You have typically, you take your ETL from your warehouse and start modeling that on Hadoop. You know, one, one is your ingest data, you know, from your sourced uh, warehouses into Hadoop. You land some data and for, you know, uh, ETL purposes, you create some materialized views, right? So typically you have your warehouse, you know, you know and you also have your reporting warehouse, right? Which is data marts from ODS. So you get your raw data, which is your facts and dimensions, and then create materialist views, you know, typically with time dimension for, you know, daily summaries, you know, weekly summaries, like, you know, sales. Um, sales fact, from sales fact, you create, you know, sales daily materialized view and, you know, sales uh, monthly materialized view, right? So that you can do some, you know, reporting and slicing and dicing. So it starts with, you know, simple hive jobs, you know, big jobs maybe, and, um, this is how typically it is, you know, very simple data pipeline starts, right? Um, and then, you know, typically you model as a Uzi workflow or, you know, you could use Talent or Pentaho or whatever else that, you know, uh, you know you're used to. But then eventually, you know, you, you have, um, I'm not sure how this is seen here. Okay. So then, you know, you, you start experimenting with this and it becomes, you know, people start liking this um, and you, 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 whatever was ad hoc becomes, you know, recurring feeds, right? So you now have to have, think about partitioning structure, how do you actually partition the data, how do you, you know, mutate the data, how do you reinstate the data if there is a problem, you know, uh, upstream. Then you also have to handle late data variables. You know, this is not very common in uh, machine-generated data, but if it's audit, right, if it's financial data, you have this notion of close of books, right? And you could have out of band data coming in for an event that is already closed, right? And you know that can come based on SLAs defined by upstream, right? Uh, you also have for you know capacity uh, purposes as well as compliance purposes. If you have you know any data that's PII, person, personally identifiable information, SOX tells you you can't have that data lying on your you know uh, system uh, more than 90 days, right? It depends on you know. Uh, industry to industry, but SOX typically is 90 days, you have to anonymize the data, right? So either you, you dispose the data or, you know, anonymize the data. Um, then, you know, you start with, you know, research clusters or staging clusters, then you have production clusters and, you know, you have multiple ways of, um, you know, uh, uh, meeting SLAs, right? So you, you kind of divide your clusters into different class of users, and then, you know, everybody needs this same data, so you start with replication. The other scenario with replication is BCP, right? If this is very critical data, you may want to have, D, for DR purposes, BCP this data into your secondary uh, uh, cluster, right? So there are a lot of such things. Archival is another thing, right? If you want this data for audit, um, especially in SEC uh, scenario, you need to have this data for seven years. Even though, you know, typically what's, what we see is, you know, after the first 12 weeks, the data typically becomes, you know, warm, hardly used, and after, you know, a few months, it becomes very cold. You don't want to keep your cold data, you know, costing 90 cents or, you know, $1.50 fifty 
per gigabyte, right, on, on your clusters or warehouses. So how, what is your archival policy? If you have archived, what's your restoration policy? So these things start, you know, creeping in with very simple, in what starts as a simple thing, but then what we have seen is these are the common themes that are necessary for us to, you know, implement, right? Exception handling, how do you handle errors? How do you do retries, right? There are some logic within the Hadoop framework itself, but if you want to, you know, hard retries, how do you do it? And, you know, when do you give up? What do you do, you know, after, you know, there is an error and how do you recover from an error, right? Uh, the other cross-cutting concerns are governance capabilities, right? You want to see how did this data come about, right? So which is kind of provenance. Where did this data come from? And what is the taxonomy of this data? Or, you know, if you want to do impact analysis, you know, you're looking at some uh, downstream consumers and seeing, you know, if I change the schema, or delete a column, add a column, change the type of a column, what's the impact of this in my downstream? That visibility is not there, in, you know, when you start out very, very small, right? Uh, audit. So audit is very important. If, if there's a subpoena, you know, you have to answer a subpoena and say, you know, these are the audits that I have. These are the execution audits. These are the access audits on this piece of data, right? Um, and monitoring, right? So typically what, what uh, starts small and simple becomes extremely complicated when you want to move to production, right? And these are some common recurring themes that we see. And if you want to hard code this one, or hand code this one, you know, it, you, it's a pretty complex system, right? And we've seen this customers repeating ad nauseum, and we saw uh, this pattern recurring at Yahoo, and we built a system there. And we started seeing the same thing with, you know, at Hortonworks, and we said, hey, you know, we work with uh, another company uh, in Mobi. And kind of take the be took the best practices, our learnings, you know, there are a lot of uh, impedance mismatch in the technology as well, right? Uh, HDFS is not very forgiving on, you know, a large number of small files, right? It eats up in, into your namespace because of the way it's architected, right? So a lot of these learnings, you know, are, are hard to come by, and then we took all this and the recurring problems and, you know, kind of packaged this as out-of-the-box uh, solution in Falcon, right? So, uh, so this complexity, uh, you know, keeps growing. Um, so this is the reason we kind of created Falcon. So, you know, you have a centrally, a central system to manage your data, right? Not just the life cycle, but the processing of data, ingest, ingesting of data, right from ingest to export of this data to external systems like reporting databases and such. Uh, business continuity and, you know, disaster recovery. So we have out-of-the-box policies for, you know, replication, eviction, uh, disposition rules, and these are customizable, right? The very simple declarative language that we provide, uh, and you just include them, and, you know, those are available out-of-the-box uh, for you. And end-to-end -end monitoring, which is non-trivial, right? If you have to stitch multiple things today, Hive, if you just run a Hive job on, you know, a head node, you don't know. I mean, from a there is no central monitoring system for you to do that today, right? And of course, most important is the audit and compliance requirements, right? You want to have lineage. You want to have audits for every execution. And if this is something that is doing, that is being executed every minute for you know three years, you want to know what all happened, what changes has happened over the over the three years. You know, how does this data uh, set? or this table has changed over the last three years, right? These are interesting things that should be tracked. Um, and also tagging, right? So there is always, you know, ETL is about technical metadata, right? The, in the ETL world, the developers call something sales, but in the BI world, they may call the same thing as profit. How do you correlate them together, right? There's no way to do that. So you need some kind of metadata catalog uh, where it allows you to tag things and also, associate source provenance, right? You're sucking up, you know, let's say you're scooping data from a DB2 or a Teradata into uh, Hadoop. You want to know the provenance of this data, right? Where did this data come from? This is very important for even dimension data, right? Because dimension is essentially, dimension data is a copy typically uh, from your source uh, warehouse into Hadoop. So you want to know where is the source of truth if you want to reinstate it. Um, so, uh, so Falcon provides, you know, all these abstractions uh, in a simple declarative language out of the box, and all these are extensible as well. Um, 
and you know it handle it kind of gives you a higher layer of abstraction to deal with instead of you know dealing with all the nuances you start dealing with you know data as data process you know and infrastructure which we're going to cover a little more in detail so it provides three different you know entities we call them entities so one is your infrastructure infrastructure is extensible today we support hadoop cluster we're working on a database now um, so you have a bunch of endpoints right uh, in a cluster nothing else right it's logical nothing is hard coded you have notion of a feed which essentially is a data set right it could it could be a table in your hive uh, uh, Hive database, or it's just a bunch of files sitting on a directory on HDFS, right? Uh, it could it could be either one of them, and you have some processing on this data, cr maybe creating you know another data set, right? Um, and it it doesn't reinvent the wheel; it uses everything within the Hadoop ecosystem, so it it kind of orchestrates the the processing pipeline uh, and schedules them in OZ. Right. So you don't actually look at OZ at all. It's completely hidden from you, but we use that because it is part of the Hadoop ecosystem. Um, so looking into um, the architecture, so Falcon you know, doesn't do heavy lift, any heavy lifting, right? It's a very simple uh, system which provides RESTful APIs. And the most important thing, as I spoke about, is this, the Trinity. The infrastructure data on you know multiple infrastructures and the process that consumes the data, and then generates you know maybe uh, uh, you know more data, right? So that's all is the three abstractions that the user deal with. With this, you know, there is a lot of intent that is captured from the user, right? And it essentially takes this definition from the user and creates an orchestration workflow, right? We will we'll look at some examples, but you know if you say I have this data. My source is, you know, cluster one, and my, you know, uh, target is, you know, this cluster two. Automatically, we know we need to now materialize a replication workflow, right? So for each policy, there is an orchestration workflow which is generated by Falcon, and as soon as data becomes available at the source, it actually copies the data to the to the target and has retries, you know, and captures a lot of metadata. Uh, you can also say how many times it needs to retry and you know, it has checkpointing and you know, all the most efficient things that you could think of. You can also have one to many, right? To, or many to one copies. So the interesting thing is, you know, if you have uh, local data centers and you you only get data for a particular region, let's say, you know, uh, US ha you know, has East Coast, West Coast, right? You can have subpartitions there that are hosted on different data centers and you don't want to take all your raw data into your global data center because you know transferring large amounts of raw data or van is just not prudent right so you can do local aggregations within your local data center which you know um, which is very simple to do in falcon and then ship only the aggregated data into your global data center right and process your global aggregations in your global data center right so all this can be expressed in very simple declarative language and falcon takes care of actually materializing these different workflows Across different clusters in you know um, in, in your in your enterprise, um, so it it stores all the user configuration in HDFS. Um, it you know you could model your data sets uh, both that live in Hive as tables uh, with partitions with or without partitions, as well as you know data on HDFS. Uh, it uses Uzi as the scheduling engine, as well as you know the workflow materialization or rationalization happens within Uzi, um, and we support uh, today Pig, Hive, um, and uh, you know if you ha you can you can model your processing pipeline as a Pig script or a Hive script or a series of them, and you know uh, have dependencies between them so that you can chain a, a, a stitch along processing. Uh, pipeline together. Uh, we also support a DAG engine, which is you know expressed as Uzi today, uh, but it's very easy to ex you know write you know new engines for cascading or Spark or you know anything else that you may want to have. Um, we also use you know JMS is used today. JMS compliant uh, queue is used uh, today for communicating between Uzi and Falcon. Uh, we ship ActiveMQ out of the box, but you know if you have an enterprise uh, MQ, 
which is JMS compliant, you could use that as well. Um, you know, Falcon does a bunch of things along with the user processing. If you have a pick script, it, uh, it basically decorates that script with you know, some pre-processing and post-processing. And the pre-processing will actually you know, record the data size so that you know, for, for out-of-band events, if we see if there are newer events that have come in and the data size has changed, it constantly monitors them and you know, re-triggers your workflow. Um, so it, it's also, we also have Ambari integration. Ambari uh, installs Falcon and monitors, manages that as well uh, today. Um, so I think I spoke about this um, this thing. So we we have these three abstractions, which is you know cluster. So a data set can be stored in one or more clusters. So this is one cool thing, right? If you have one the same data across multiple clusters, you could def define one feed definition and say these are the clusters that this feed participates in. And you know you always start small, right? You add this data to another cluster. It's very easy to go and say, you know, add one more cluster and automatically Falcon knows that this feed now, you know, this data is now available in more than one cluster, right? Without you having to go materialize anything in a different cluster. Uh, same thing with process, right? If you want to do hot, hot processing, none of the tools that I know today supports, you know, uh, kind of BCP, hot, hot BCP for processing. So you can have a pick script and, you know, in Falcon, if you have more than one cluster, it automatically rationalizes or materializes those uh, pipelines across multiple clusters. Um, um, you know, the, the definition itself is, you know, very flexible. You could use JAXP, JSON, you know, Java APIs as well, um, uh, or XML. XML is, you know, most preferred and, you know, very simple. Um, it's also very modular. We can look at some examples. Um, then we ship out-of-the-box policies for uh, replication, retention. Uh, replication, as you know, today is executed on the target. It's a pull model because typically you don't want to consume, you know, your uh, uh, capacity on your primary production cluster. But we have something called recipes now where you could actually launch it on the source. Um, the other thing we support is the um, uh, disposition rules, which is eviction. So you can say, you know, retain this data or archive this data or, you know, chmod or change the owner of this data after, you know, seven days, seven years, whatever periodicity that you have, and we handle that in bulk, right? We delete, I, you could do hard deletes, uh, you could do soft deletes, um, things like that. We also support late data handling, which, you know, I'm gonna cover a little bit in detail. Um, so everything is pluggable at this point. Um, you can also you know, invoke third-party uh, libraries. So if you want data masking or data quality checks as part of your you know, processing when you're doing ETL, you can write your custom code and stick it in as a Java uh, process, and that is executed by Falcon. So the good thing is Falcon is not intrusive. It doesn't know, it doesn't inspect the bits. It doesn't know about your data. It's all logical, but it, it basically orchestrates everything you know, as soon as the data becomes available on the, on the uh, cluster. Okay, so as I said, we support three engines today, Uzi, uh, Pig, and Hive. Um, but, uh, you know, Uzi supports a bunch of actions. You can do, you know, shell scripts, Java, plain Java action, Java MapReduce, uh, you know, scoop jobs for ingest, um, disk CP if you want, you know, custom control, things like that. It also pro has a REST, REST action, so if you want to invoke a web service externally, you could do that. So if you want complex DAG engine, you could use Uzi today. But as I said, this is very uh, easy to extend in Falcon. And we are actually working on making this completely pluggable um, so that you don't have to write any Java code. So pipeline monitoring. Um, so we have, um, you know, for every run, right, when, when it starts, we get, Falcon gets a notification that it has started. And if there is a failure or, you know, if, there, if it completes either it, you know, in failed state or successful state, you know, Falcon gets notification, right? So there's, then you could, you could do alerting, you know, you could do um, just log this somewhere. 
So it's all JMS compliance. We also have messages. So there's a Falcon internal queue, uh, which it posts messages into, but there's also a user queue. So this is the first thing where user level notifications are supported in the Hadoop uh, you know, ecosystem. So if you, you can build a dashboard based on these notifications yourself, right? Uh, you could do alerting, you could, you could you know, basically collate this and write it to a database and drive a dashboard out of that. Um, or you could, you could change scheduling things external to Hadoop, right, from these alerts. So you could do that as well. Um, we have some form shape of UI today which actually, you know, alerts and, you know, looks at all the historical runs. So you can, given a time range and a pipeline, it gives you what all runs has happened, how many, uh, how many runs have happened for each execution. So if you have a daily pipeline or hourly pipeline, you can look at an hour uh, and say, you know, whether this was successful in the first attempt or, you know, it was successful in the second attempt or, you know, it, it completely failed after exhausting all the retry attempts. Um, And this is integrated into Ambari now. Um, okay, so replication, right? So typically in, in, in ETL, right, you, we create a lot of intermediate data, right? So you can decide what to replicate, right? There is a paradigm shift from, you know, typical data warehouse uh, architecture into Hadoop, right? So in a typical data warehouse, a lot of data is cleansed and you know, purpose built for your specific use cases. So you don't actually have the raw data. And you know, if you want BCP or replication, you take this data that is actually cleansed and you know, ready to be presented, uh, copied over. But in Hadoop, since you know, it, it's very cheap to store data, we typically get the raw data and keep the raw data. Right? You could replicate the raw data as well because you can now run through your same ETL process and get your, your cleansed data and confirmed data, right? If you're taking customer data from your CRM and you know, ERP and other systems, you want one copy of data. But here you could have multiple copies and reconcile them at, you know, at will, right? So you could, you know, if this is your kind of processing stages, you could decide to take just the stage data and the presented data and replicate them and have different retention policies for each of these, right? So similarly, if you, if you decide to keep that you know, intermediate data, you could have different retention uh, periods for these data sets. That's it. So it's very flexible in modeling you know, how you want to uh, uh, implement uh, these lifecycle policies. Right? OK. Coming to late data handling, so I think I briefly spoke about it. This is very common in, in an enterprise, right? You always have uh, data coming in, and either there was a problem in the upstream uh, system or there were out-of-band events that came in late, but it belonged to the window of time that was closed previously, right? So how do you handle it? It's, it's a non-trivial problem, right? So here in, in Falcon, we allow you to, you know, tag or mark uh, or annotate a data set and say, you know what, this data set is marked for late arrival and the window is, you know, four hours, six hours, you know, 30 minutes, whatever is your window of time, your SLA is for from the upstream. You can just mark it and anytime a process uses this um, data that is annotated for late arrival will now be re-triggered whenever there's new data, right? So what, how this is done is, you know, it, as soon as the data becomes available, the process is triggered because you don't want to, you know, miss your SLAs, right? Or you may not have any, you know, out-of-band band data coming in. So Falcon automatically triggers as soon as this data becomes available. But for the, for the, when you have annotated that, you know, wait up to four hours. In that four hours, it keeps checking periodically, right? Saying, has this data changed, right? Has this data been, you know, either, um, um, reinstated, or has there been you know more data that has been added to this? So as soon as it you know figures out that there is more data that's available in this, 
it re-triggers your pipeline, right? And as I said previously, you can have a complex stage, you know, we had like 700 stages pipeline at Yahoo, right? It's a pretty long pipeline. So it re-triggers the entire chain. You don't have to do anything, right? Um, so it basically eliminates, you know, very uh, writing complex data handling rules within applications. Okay, metadata services. So we, you know, Falcon integrates very uh, intimately with uh, Edge Catalog, uh, deeply with Edge Catalog, and um, so you could represent, you know, instead of representing, you know, files on HDFS or arbitrary directories as data sets. You could now represent uh, tables in Edge Catalog or Hive, and uh, you could run, you know, MapReduce jobs or Pig or you know Hive jobs on these tables. Um, we automatically provide, you know, integrate Edge Catalog, uh, you know, loaders for Pig, uh, loaders and storers for Pig, um, and MapReduce. Um, okay. Any questions so far? Uh, let's move into data governance. So, you know, these are some of the critical things we think are, are important for governance. One is, you know, kind of dependency tracking, right? You want to see, because, you know, people have 70,000, you know, 150,000 tables uh, in, your, in your warehouse, Hadoop warehouse, and you don't know what the dependencies are you don't know if somebody's using something or not, right? It's just very hard to figure where do I start. And as I said previously, you know, we typically try to keep all the raw data. You may have, you know, six claims databases. You may have, you know, a lot of uh, siloed data. Just looking at that, you know, mass of data is very hard. So you want somebody, you know, you would have tagged it on ingest, right? You want, to, you want some kind of tagging uh, ability to tag data sets, ability to search based on those tags. The classic thing is, you know, you may be getting some customer data uh, and you have some PII information. So on, on ingest, if you have the customer address, the customer ID, you know, email, all this is, you know, PII information. You want to mask them, right? Or at least know that this is PII. So, so tagging becomes very, very critical for you to drive your next stage of processing, right? For anonymization, masking, what have you. The second thing is, you know, you want to track lineage, right? Because as I said, one is the provenance use case where you want to go back saying, how did this arrive, yeah, come about? Who created this, right? Where, what is the source of this data? I want to go until the source, right? The second thing is who is using this one? Some, you know, kind of impact analysis. So you want this provided out of the box uh, for you, right? The another critical feature is audit. Like how do you know every time somebody accesses it, or every time this data is consumed or a process executed, and something else generated, you want to audit this information, saying who did what when, right, um, and where. So this tracing capability uh, is very important for for uh, compliance purposes. And all these are, you know, implemented within Falcon for, for Falcon pipelines, right? So, you know, metadata on ingest, right? So what's, what's the format? Can I figure out what the format is? I mean, if, if you're using Hive, you know, we get this for free. But if you're not, you will be allowed, you know, to tag this information saying, this is a sequence file on HDFS, right? Or, you know, if you have Avro or, you know, a custom, you've written a custom format, custom encoding format, you could actually tag the data and so that others, others could discover this information. Um, and what source system did this come from, right? This is the provenance information. If you have, you know, different um, a business glossary associated with your source systems, you want to import that as well, right? You don't want to leave that um, in a siloed uh, system. So how do you do that, right? So you have, we support ingest descriptors and you know, if you have schema versioning in, in Hive and Edge Catalog, uh, you could use that. So we also support access control. Every entity has access control. You could give you know, what the, who the user is, who, which group is allowed to actually look at this uh, data or process, and also what permissions do they have on this data, right? 
So when, when it's copied, the permissions are preserved and if it's invalidated against the ACL that you have declared uh, within these entities, right? Um, you could also have, you know, uh, as I said, if, if a column is marked as PII, right, you can have subsequent usages of this data or derived data that, that depends on this marked as secure or PII, right? We have this automatically taken care of. Um, the other thing is, you know, lineage. So how do I chase down the sources, right, of data leading to reports and reports? So if you have some kind of profit that you're looking at, you want to see, you know, the source of truth, and based on that, see, you know, how reliable this is, right? So one example is, you know, we have this um, a customer who has this claims database. They have these measures that they have defined, right? Uh, typically, you know, it's about two million, three million claims on, on, on any given day, right? But on Saturdays, it is, you know, low, and Sundays, it's almost zero, right? So it's all in people's head saying, you know, Sundays, claims are processed on Monday, right? Monday, there's very high volume. But suddenly, if something drops to, you know, uh, half a million from two million, they don't know why, right? They don't even know whether to reliably take this and say, you know what, this is correct data. So there are some measures that you can define which says, you know, the variance, it should be around two million, but the variance can be, you know, 10%, right? Not beyond that, right? So all these measures can be captured and can be used for processing further down, right, um, downstream. So this is how, you know, entity dependency uh, is shown in Falcon. So you have um, a raw data feed. Uh, the cleanse process actually depends on uh, raw data feed. Uh, executes on a primary cluster. There are two clusters here in, in, the, in the demo. And, you know, it, the cleanse process generates uh, cleanse data feeds. So this kind of, you know, gives you a picture, a high-level level picture of, you know, what the dependencies are at, at, at a high level. Um, so this is a very simple lineage picture. Um, so here we have, you know, it's unfortunately cropped a little bit, but, you know, if you see the blue ones are uh, processes and, you know, green ones are um, uh, data sets. Uh, and the one with the dark gray circle on the top is the terminal node. So here there are, there are two ingest processes. Uh, one is actually getting impressions feed, you know, from some source system. And the other one is taking uh, the clicks and actually joining the clicks and impression to see you know, what the clicked impressions are. And it's generating a data feed which is clicked impressions. So if you click on any of these, you get the bunch of tags, you know, you get you know, what the workflow engine was, which is pig here, uh, the version, which cluster was this, you know, executed. There are a bunch of tags here which says you know, publisher was you know, BI, owner is you know, this BI, which is the reporting uh, owned by a certain user. And these tags are, you know, customizable. You can add as many tags as you want, and all that, you know, would show up here, right? Um, so I think we spoke about this one, uh, tagging. So you could, you could add as many tags as you want, and, you know, you could, we also support pipeline names. So you can have a set of pipelines. You can say this is, you know, BI pipeline, this is part of ETL pipeline, or, you know, foundation ETL pipeline, things like that. Uh, we support access control uh, with 0 0.6. So authorization is driven out of this ACLs. So you can enable authorization or disable authorization within Falcon. Um, audit. So we audit all the executions that are triggered by Falcon. And we are adding now a search capability where you can search you know, things on, based on tags, based on the entity names that you've created. Uh, we also support full text search. Um, and so that you can drill down, you know. Um. So the technology for just the governance part, so the metadata, there is a, there is a metadata repository, right? This is very, very um, centered around Falcon. The repository is a Titan graph database. Um, it's pretty interesting because, you know, this dependencies that the user has expressed is captured uh, within the graph, uh, and it's very visual. Um, it's a, it has a pluggable back, backing store. 
uh, you know, by default we ship Berkeley DB JE because you know the scale is very low. But if you think you, know, you want to scale out to hundreds of thousands of feeds and you know processes, uh, you could use HBase. Um, all the metadata is stored in the repository. So if you tag something as PII, you know you can actually go and do very interesting searches. How it's stored is you know all the PII you know tagged assets within the system will point to one node, which is PII. So you can you can do pretty interesting searches that give me all the data sets that are secure and owned by certain user, right? Give me all the data sets that are uh, participating in foundation ETL pipeline, right? Uh, or give me all the data sets that has been accessed by this user or owned by this user. Uh, so you can do very interesting searches like that uh, within the repository. Uh, so another unique thing to Falcon, which I don't think even you know very expensive tools do, is the execution metadata. So typically the design, so the the feed, the the process is all design metadata, right? This is your design, and execution is different, right? So what Falcon supports is also a notion of optional inputs. So if you let's say you have you know uh, four inputs, uh, and you have two dimensions that you know are not necessarily useful, but if it's there, you would use it, right? So it becomes optional. So it doesn't gate on those two inputs, right? If it is there, it uses them. If it is not there, it doesn't use them. So every execution typically you know, could result in using different inputs, right? So at design, you're saying I have four inputs, but at runtime, I could use two, three, or all the four, right? Because you know, some are declared as optional. So every execution's metadata is captured. Right, so it's very, very strong, and you know, the truth is actually captured not in some block file. Right, uh, this is again stored in the metadata repository, so you could actually look at you know what inputs were consumed for each execution uh, in Falcon. Uh, search is also you know has a pluggable backend. You could either use Solar or Elasticsearch uh, today. So any questions? Okay, um, so we just released, I think, 0 0.6 sometime in January, um, and we're working on, like, you know, 0, 0 0.6.1 will be released pretty soon, and we are working on 0 0.7 at this point. So we added something called recipes, right? We Falcon ships things out of the box, and you know, you have to change the core code of Falcon to change the behavior or add new things, right? So recipe essentially gives you a way to customize certain behavior, right? So the classic thing is, you know, you want to do data masking, right? There is no one way to do it, but it, you know, you could, somebody could contribute this as a cookbook and, you know, very simple code, which is, you know, could be Java code or pick code or hive code, which essentially takes a column which is configurable and says, you know what, if it's social security number, mask the last four digits or you know first sex one, whatever, right? So or mask the whole thing, right? It's all can be configured to one. And if you write it once and add it as a recipe, Falcon now can actually take this and materialize and orchestrate it. And these recipes, you know, could be shared across users and organizations. So we can build a rich uh, tool set, right, of recipes which could be shared across users. So what we have built out of the box is, you know, our, so Falcon supports uh, or requires notion of partitions, right? It should be recurring partitions and it works well. If you have ad hoc directories and you want to do something with ad hoc, uh, there's no good way to do it. So we've built a recipe to actually mirror ad hoc data sets, uh, you know, in HDFS uh, across clusters. And you could, you could customize this to actually run on the source or target because you know, as I said, the, the built-in behavior of Falcon is to actually launch the replication on target. Um, so it's basically a templated uh, you know, entity. Um, the other thing we have done is you know, replication was only for between Hadoop clusters, but now we support replication between Hadoop and you know, cloud uh, services. We support both Azure and uh, Amazon S3. So this is classical thing for you know, archiving data, right? If you want to archive data into cloud, from on-prem, if you have you know a smaller footprint of on-prem, uh, 
Hadoop cluster, you could archive this data into Azure or uh, S3. And it's again very declarative, uh, simple, simple to do. Um, so these are some of the you know monitoring and uh, you know configuration management aspects of Falcon that we are releasing uh, pretty soon. Uh, you could look at you know different entities here, what the la latest status is for each of them. Um, you could also create an entity uh, using the UI. You don't have to hand code anything, um, and you know you could create all of a process. I think you could create a process and a feed at this point. Um, Uh, it, it also shows you a preview of you know how it looks like uh, in XML on the right while you're class you know configuring it. Um, okay. Any questions? You want to see more? Uh, Yes. Hello? Okay. Um, I saw you, um, the part with the audit, which should come soon. Can you please explain in detail, a little bit more in detail, what features will there be available? In terms of audit? In so, terms of audit, yeah. So audit. The, the good thing with uh, Falcon is, you know, every execution is controlled by Falcon, right? So we are basically logging every execution today. Mm -hmm. For every successful execution, we capture the lineage of that and you know, shove it into the metadata repository. Mm -hmm. So it's much stronger than just living somewhere in an audit file, right? Because every execution is captured and actually stored in a, the Titan you know, graph database. Okay. And you go to an entity and you can now navigate to all the instances for that entity or, you know, or, over a period of time. Okay, thanks. And every execution also captures what inputs were processed, right? Uh, what partitions were processed, what partitions were generated. So all that links or edges are there. And how, how do you make sure, for example, if a file should be deleted in one week, that the file is deleted and it's not uh, still there? Yeah, Falcon handles that, right? For okay. You. So if it, if it is, you know, a daily, uh, if it's less than 24 hours, if the periodicity is less than a day, Falcon actually launches a workflow every six hours, so four times a day, mm. and bulk deletes them. If it's if the periodicity of your feed is more than a day, then it runs once a day. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you guys.